You know what? I, I was going to preach on a totally different topic today, but I'm stuck in courageous faith in perilous times. And having been in Daniel, how could I not talk about Daniel in the lion's den? I mean, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> so God overruled what I was going to preach on. I won't tell you what it was, but God overruled that, and I'm back in Daniel chapter 6. So you can turn there and get ready. The story of Daniel in the lion's den is probably um, one of the most well-known, if not the most well-known stories in the Old Testament. Everybody knows the story of Daniel in the lion's den. But as we look at Daniel 6, I'd like to suggest to you that this is a testament of how Daniel is God's amazing example of how a person can remain rooted and grounded in God throughout his life, from his teen years all the way through adulthood into their golden years. Because Daniel, at the point that we're going to be seeing him today, was at least 80 years old. At least 80 years old. The life and times of Daniel were filled with constant change. And this is another reason I love Daniel, because we we trace his life through the beginning of the Babylonian captivity all the way to the end. He was there for those 70 years. And you can see the swirl of changing times and fortunes throughout the first five chapters of the book. Teenagers uprooted from the stability of their parents' love, a settled home life, and separated from their religious community, Daniel and his friends were thrust into captivity in a foreign land with foreign customs and a foreign language. I don't know if you know what that's like. Do you know what it's like to be in a place that nobody speaks English? I've been there. It's daunting, people. It's daunting. And they were captives. They were completely engulfed and encircled by this new nation that they had been brought to as captives. But they remained resilient in God. They were confronted by alien demands to disregard their heritage and upbringing and lay aside their social and religious norms only to embrace their new and most strange situation. They were commanded to despise the truth that their fathers had taught them of their faith and worship and told to worship a golden image. Well, we know how that turned out last week. Solid. They're just solid. And in all these trials, Daniel and his friends remained steadfast with their integrity intact. And Daniel, growing old in the city of his captivity, witnessed firsthand the vacillating, capricious demands of a totalitarian monarch, Nebuchadnezzar. You think, we've got troubles. Nebuchadnezzar was a king of kings. He was the pure gold head of that statue. And he was able, Daniel, was able to see Nebuchadnezzar come and go. Amazing. He was personally present at the outrageous change of fortune in that majestic king's life when God humbled him and brought about his eventual testimony. Look at chapter 4. And I'd like to read verse 34 and following here. Chapter 4, 34. But at the end of that period, after he was out in the fields eating grass like a, an animal, at the end of that period, Nebuchadnezzar said that, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. This is Nebuchadnezzar. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His his kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Nobody can question God's sovereignty. And at that time, my reason returned to me And my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. And so I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. The king of heaven. For all his works are true. 
and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Wow. <laughs> That's Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel was able to witness this people. And he saw this. Only to see then the great city of Babylon overrun by the Medo-Persian regime. And, and that took place. He observed it up close and personal. The demise of a 60-year reign come to a sudden end in one evening. Remember the writing on the wall, right? And Cyrus took the, frame, uh, the famed city of Babylon in an evening. Unbelievable transformation there. Yet in stark contrast, all the tumult of the years that swirled around Daniel, this man stood firmly in place, Daniel. His character, his integrity, unchanged, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, Daniel, rooted and grounded in God. And sure as the rising of the sun each morning, and as certain as the months in each year, Daniel stood strong. He's the living example of Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 24 through 25. Remember that parable? He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine that I'm preaching and acts on them, not just listens to them, but actually believes them and acts on them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on a rock. Daniel's life, his entire life, was built upon that same rock. The God of heaven. And now Daniel, in Daniel 6, it provides us with one final narrative that establishes him to be the paragon of a faithful man, unwavering, committed to God, no matter what the cost involved. And that's why I'm preaching it this morning. Courageous faith in a perilous time. I believe that perilous times are coming to us, to the United States of America. I don't know when it'll break out, but all signals are leading in that direction. And I want us to be courageous as Christians. That's why I want you to come to the conference. I want you to hear of other men who are courageous presently in their ministries, and I want us to emulate them and follow them, even as we might emulate Daniel. So in this chapter, Daniel must be at least 80 years of age. For the past 60 years, he's proven what a life of commitment looks like in the face of shifting sands of a pagan culture. Another reason I love Daniel. Three pagan regimes, and the man still remains at the top of his game as a believer in Yahweh. Intense political intrigue, constant ebb and flow of capricious pagan leaders all around him. So here's this old man, still going strong. He gives me hope. He gives me hope, personally. The power of a virtuous life extends into old age. Newman Darlin, a scholar of accepted standing, made an analysis of the lives and achievements of 400 of the foremost characters of history. And his analysis showed that nearly 80% of the world's greatest figures closed active lives between 58 and 80 years of age. 58 and 80 years of age. 25% were beyond 70 years old, and then 22.5% were beyond 80 years of age, and 6% went beyond 90 years of age. When 83 years old, Gladstone for the fourth time became the Prime Minister of England at 83 years old. Michelangelo, at 89, executed his painting, The Last Judgment, perhaps the most famous single picture in the world. He was 89 years old. John Wesley preached with almost in undiminished eloquence at 88 years old, closing at that remarkable age, a most remarkable career of all time, having traveled a quarter of a million miles <laughs> in an age that knew neither electricity nor steam. He rode a horse, people. And he had delivered, someone estimated, at least 4,000 sermons. 
and written volumes in books that we still have today. Edison was still inventing at 90 years old. Wright at 90 was considered a most creative architect. Shaw was still writing plays at 90. Grandma Moses began, began painting at 79. Ladies, it's not too late. Okay? 79, J.C. Penney, a great Christian, was working strenuously at his business at 95 years old. So when am I going to retire? It ain't happening, people. (laughs) By the grace of God, I have heroes in this book. Daniel and Moses, whose vigor was not abated in his vision, and he was 90. May God bless Yet many say, oh, I'm 55, i got to get out. And in doing so, you forfeit the richness of age and the richness that you have and the blessing that you could be, that you've gained through the years that you've lived. Daniel was pushing 90, I think, and he was God's man, and and God put him right where he wanted him, and the politics of Medo-Persia had little to do to withstand it. God wanted Daniel to go into the lion's den. And we'll see about that in a moment. So today is a sermon to challenge us to persistent endurance and faithfulness in the faith of opposition. No matter our age. No matter our age. Be faithful. Be courageous, people. Now I've got an outline in your bulletin for you, and I will get through all six points by the grace of God today. Um... In the Old Testament, it's a lot easier because there are narratives so we can preach the story, so to speak, instead of having to break down uh, all verses uh, in the text. But let me begin by asking God to bless our time together, and then we'll read Daniel 6, 1 through 15 to get started. Let's pray. Dearest Heavenly Father, as we come to this text of Scripture, a marvelous story that is true, it actually happened And Father, we are amazed at this man named Daniel. Lord, from his early teenage years, he proved to be your servant, a faithful man who would not bow the knee to things that were against his religion. Oh God, we live in a day where we're being asked to do such things, and that will only increase. Father, we recognize that this entire world lies in the hands of the evil one. It has been usurped by Satan. And Jesus Christ has not yet come back to claim it for his own. But he will. And we believe it to be soon. May he, be, may he find us being faithful when he does return. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So look at Daniel 6, and I'll read the first 15 verses. It seemed good to Darius to appoint uh, 120 satraps over the kingdom and that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom and over them three commissioners of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps may be accountable to them, the three commissioners, and that the king might not suffer loss. So they're watching over the realm, watchers of the realm, right? Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners, there were three of them, and the satraps, 120 of them. And he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king, King Darius, a pagan, planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. So, like, he's moving on up. Okay, he's already, like, third in the kingdom, but he's moving beyond that. And when the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could not find they could not find no ground, or they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption, inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. And then these men said, Well, we're not going to find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. What a testimony. And then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement, or that actually means they they became a throng. They got a quorum together amongst themselves to the king, and they spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. 
all the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition in, in, uh, to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into a lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be ch uh, changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. And therefore, King Darius signed the document that is the injunction. Enter Daniel. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, because he was high up in the government, he knew what was going on, he entered into his house, and now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. It was his little prayer closet. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. And then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. And then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? And the king replied, The statement is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you sign, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Well, then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is law of the Medes and Persians and that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So that's just the first part. That's kind of like the first salvo. It's a prelude to the test of Daniel being put into the lion's den. It's the reason why he was put into the lion's den. And first, we want to see the preeminence of Daniel. Daniel 6.3 states that he had an extraordinary spirit. It was a spirit that made him stand out amongst the other leaders that he was part of. It was a spirit that made Darius take notice of him. This is called a testimony. We don't talk a lot about our personal testimonies, except for maybe at baptism time or something. But you, Christian, are a testimony to a watching world. Whether or not you're a testimony to God's glory remains to be seen. That each of you must answer in your own heart. But Daniel, for his part, was an incredible testimony, extraordinary. And I love the word extraordinary because it means extraordinary. He is beyond ordinary. He stood out, right? From his first days of Babylon, Daniel's spirit had been recognized by every king he served. King Nebuchadnezzar had promoted him to be the position ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men. You see that in Daniel 2.48. And now, here the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. 6.3. It's happening again, kind of like Joseph. You know, you put him down and he just pops back up, pops back up, and God's favor was upon him. Can't you just picture this aged saint, now approximately 80 years old, having trusted God from his youth forward? He must have had a, an aura of calm and dignified confidence surrounding him. I would picture him as being one of those guys, I don't know if you know anybody like this, I've known a couple in my life, that when you get around them, they just have so much <sighs> wibawa. It's an Indonesian word. What is wibawa? Decorum, decorum. They have so much decorum about them that they make you quiet. It's like going, have you ever been in a St. Paul Cathedral? When you walk in there, you don't sit and chatter and, and laugh and joke around. It quiets you just by its magnificence. That's, what, that's the way I picture Daniel. And yes, he had a beard longer than Jim's. 
80 years old, Jim. I mean, you got a few years ago. But this man just oozed dignity. And this is Daniel. Just his presence must have brought with it dignity and composure. But, but King Darius' recognition and potential to make him over the entire kingdom was just a little bit too much for the Chaldeans to stomach. Same problem the three faced. Those Chaldeans, they, they did not like what they were seeing. The plot against Daniel takes place in verses 4 through 9. The commissioners, the satraps, obviously predominantly Chaldean, ever jealous and filled with anti-Semitic sentiment against Daniel, they were determined to do whatever it took to keep him from that position. And they planned to do something to him. He is blameless in his civic life. This is the first thing that we learn about Daniel in verses 4 and 5. The other two rulers and some of the satraps in their unbridled ambition began to look for something that they could accuse Daniel of. And Daniel, thinking that he'd do some wrongdoing in the context of his work, they could accuse him because they were all corrupt. So they knew he had to be corrupt. But they couldn't find anything. Reminds me of Proverbs 26 through 7. Many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy man, a righteous man who walks in his integrity? How blessed are his sons after him. Daniel walked in his integrity. And everybody saw it. And even these yokels who wanted to put him down had to admit, there's no way we can accuse this man. Daniel 6.4 shows what they discovered. After trying to find ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, so in regard to his political uh, working and everything, in his politics, they couldn't find anything to accuse him of. They could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. There was no corruption in so much as he was faithful. So there was no active corruption, things that he was doing that would mark him out, and there was no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Negligence means that he didn't not do the things he should do. So omission, commission. He's clean. And they couldn't find anything against him. The corruption refers to sins of commission. The negligence refers to sins of omission. He didn't leave off doing things he should do. On both counts, Daniel was found blameless. Now, Daniel was blameless in his religious life as well, not only his civic life. 1 Timothy 3, 2 and, and Titus 1, 7 both address the need for leaders in the church to be above reproach, to be blameless. It does not mean sinless perfection. It means that accusations can be hurled against the leaders, but they do not stick. Daniel's the epitome of what a character quality looks like of blamelessness in real life. Daniel was not sinlessly perfect. He was a human being, therefore he was a sinner. But in the discharge of his responsibilities as a man of God, he was a man of integrity. He was a man of consistency. He could be relied upon, trusted. If Daniel would have been inconsistent in the slightest area of his life and responsibilities, don't you think his enemies would have found it? They were looking. They were looking. But being the man that he was, his enemies had to use that very virtue against him. And herein is the evilness of men. This is just amazing, right? Daniel exemplifies the lesson taught in 1 Peter 4.19. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God will entrust their souls to the faithful creator to do what is right. Daniel had been doing that all his life, but Daniel was not only faithful in his public affairs, he is also faithful in his personal religious affairs. And this is what those wicked men came to understand after placing every aspect of his life under a magnifying glass. We'll not find any ground of accusation against him unless we find it in regard to the law of his God. Daniel had not been a secret worshiper of God. When it says he went up to his rooftop, that's in front of God and everybody, and he opened the windows so anybody could see him. 
He prayed to God, and these men figured out an easy way to disqualify Daniel. Their plot exposes the fact that he wasn't a secret worshiper of God. And secondly, the opposition believed that Daniel's degree of commitment was great enough to keep him from changing, even though faced by the penalty of death. They used his very integrity in his worship of God, Yahweh, to accuse him. How evil must you be? Beware of the wiles of the evil one. He turns truth on its head. It's always that way with Satan. And those who follow his ways, he'll promote the exact opposite of what should be commended. We see that happening today everywhere, people. Good is bad, and bad is good. Evil is rewarded, and good is penalized. That's why I say prepare your hearts. And in a little bit, I'll tell you how we can prepare day by day, people, that when the crucible comes, we're ready. And it won't be some odd thing that we're needing to do because we will have been practicing our integrity towards God. It was the opposers' own corruption that drove them to call right wrong and wrong right. And violation of their scheme would be punishable by death. Now, you don't come out of a lion's den. That was a a way of punishment that they practiced during those days, and nobody got out. That was a given. James 3.16 gives insight into what's taking place here. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is disorder or confusion in every evil thing. And these men that were trapping Daniel were filled with jealousy and selfish ambition. They were pricked by the fact and triggered by the fact that the king was even considering putting him over the realm. So they lied. They said, all the commissioners have agreed. No, they didn't. Daniel was a commissioner. (laughs) He didn't agree, right? So they misled the king in understanding that. And there were likely others in the satraps that didn't know anything about the agreement. But that throng gathered together, so they seemed to be many, and they came to the king. And then they manipulated him through flattery. They offered the king the opportunity to be a supreme deity in the kingdom for a month. Kind of like what Nebuchadnezzar did, setting up that statue. Worship me. And so they put that before Darius, that they would, he would be worshipped for a month. Because they couldn't worship anybody else except him, the man, and his gods. And the fact was well thought out scheme and Seen in the wording of 6 7, anyone who makes any petition to God or man, in that they had to put man in the proposed edict because Darius was a man and they offered him worship. But imagine the hubris of this king to be drawn in by such thought and to be talked into making such a decree that honored only himself. You know, I know Darius is kind of an anomaly because he was really distressed when Daniel was accused. He looked for a way to deliver Daniel. We'll get to that in a moment. And even in the lion's den and everything, we see Darius kind of on the side of this man. But the truth of the matter is, he was a pagan king. He was a pagan king. There are two things that I need to mention to help us get our arms around what these evil men set into action. The punishment was certain death, people. There's ample documentation of such pits in antiquity. They've dug them up. And it consisted of a, a large square cavern under the earth having a partition wall in the middle of it which is furnished with a door which the keeper can open from the top open and close from the top, sliding door, if you will. And they threw the food in one side to entice the lions from their chamber over into the open space where they threw the food. And the cavern is open on top and its mouth being surrounded by a wall of a yard and a half high. This is what archaeologists have discovered. So you wouldn't fall into the pit, but you could look in and see what was happening. And so you could look down. Fiery furnace of Daniel 3 and in lion's den were 
two of the most fearsome forms of punishment of the day, and they were rampant. It's how they kept the peace, if you would. Secondly, the law of the Medes and Persians is irrevocable. Irrevocable. The law of the Medes and Persians, which could not be altered, verse 9. By contrast, Nebuchadnezzar was a supreme king. He was the law. And so we see in this silver kingdom now, Medo-Persia, right? The head was gold, pure, meaning that he had full sway. He could, he could give an edict and take it away, and nobody could say anything because he was sovereign. But not so, the Medo-Persians. If they made a law, they could not rescind it. It was irrevocable. And so in that sense, they actually lost authority. They didn't have the amount of authority that Nebuchadnezzar had. Their power was weakened, and to change a law would be seen to be beneath the dignity of a true king. But actually, they were weakened. And tragically, King Darius was duped by the jealous commissioners, and he signed the irrevocable edict. In verse 9, we see that. Now, Daniel's prayer and its consequence, this is moving along to the end of the portion that we read, Daniel's response to the decree was to go on doing what he's always been doing. He did not change. He remained faithful. He did not think of ways out of this predicament, but he just remained consistent. I mean, he was 80 years old, at least. And so this was a well-worn trail up to his roof, open the windows, and pray three times a day. This is what he did. Knowing that the decree had been signed, he purposed in his heart to remain faithful to his God, and he went to his prayer closet, opened the windows, and prayed. He was unafraid, undeterred, bold as a lion. Bold as a lion. Obviously, those who wanted to thwart Daniel had already observed his habitual prayers in the very same place, at the very same times, and this was the way that they would get him. Daniel was simply following the instructions given to the exiles from God through the letter of Jeremiah, which writing Daniel had in his possession according to Daniel 9.2. In Jeremiah 29, 4-7, especially his injunction to pray and his assurance of God's answer to their prayers in 29.12, you see him telling them to pray three times a day, and Daniel's doing it. And Daniel also discovered that, hey, this captivity is only going to be seven years long. And he knew, hey, we're getting close. This thing's going to come to an end, but Darius is still king. Uh, I want you also to understand that uh, their manipulation before the king, these other leaders, was one of... uh, being anti-Semitic because he said, they said very clearly, one of the exiles from Judah. Spit it out, okay? That's their feelings about that. This Jew, this prisoner, this foreigner, pays no attention to your gods? No, he says, to you, king. So just like they did with the three, right? They make it personal. They make it like Daniel is personally an affront to Darius. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's just not true. Daniel so eloquently stated this to the king after the lion's den. He says in 22, 622, I was found innocent before God and also before you, O king. I have committed no crime. So he covers both bases when he comes out of the lion's den. He reaffirms to the king that he worshipped him. Uh, excuse me, that he did not do anything wrong and he worshipped his God, but he did nothing against the king. So those personal attacks were very, very intentional. And the king's response to Daniel's prayer is, is amazing. What, with character like Daniel that he possessed that had already caused King Darius to decide that he's going to make him like his guy right underneath him, He was distressed. He was disappointed in how his decree is affecting Daniel. And the king's response was very different from what Daniel's enemies might have hoped. He was deeply distressed. This is amazing. Pagan though he is, he was distraught. 
And the reason for his concern was because he knew Daniel and he had regard for Daniel. The word order in 614 in the original language places Daniel at the front. It could be read, and as for Daniel, he set his mind to deliver him. He was concerned. And it's a remarkable example of an absolute monarch being bound by a law still more absolute than his power. Every sense of justice within the king cried out that Daniel should be delivered from this law, but the law demanded that he be punished. Law of the Medes and Persians. Well, let's read 16 through 18. See what happens here. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Do you think Daniel had a testimony or what? I mean, this king isn't, this isn't out of the blue. 17, a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. And then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. So this is the king's response. They were real lions, It's a factual account. They were undoubtedly hungry lions, right? And Daniel is brought into that den. Daniel had obviously been vocal about his God with the king, as the king clearly knew not only the characteristics of Daniel's life, your God whom you constantly serve, but he also knew the characteristics of Yahweh through Daniel because he said, your God will himself deliver you. That sounds like what the three said to Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't it? It's almost their words verbatim. And even if, you, if he doesn't deliver us, he's able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship you. Or an idol. Darius says, God will himself deliver you. He knew God to be faithful to his people. And I, I have no doubt in my mind that he had heard the story of the three. I, I just know he did. God is a God of deliverance, and Daniel knew it. Do you, do you remember Isaiah 41.10 that we read about when we first started these topical sermons that we're doing? Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will, I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I believe Daniel went in with that mindset. Trusting God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego put this truth to the test in the fiery furnace. If so be, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us. Out of your hand, O king. That's what they said. That's how they went into their trial. Why would God allow something like this to take place? Daniel's a choice servant. Paul sums it up in in, in this doctrine of of why God lets these things happen. In 2 Corinthians 1.10, God delivered us from so great a peril of death, and he will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, And he will yet deliver us. And this was his response to severe suffering. Because Paul suffered. In verse 10 it says, Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves. That's why. Why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? Now I know you believe in me. Now I know you trust in me. Not in your son. Daniel was put to the test of all tests. When we read King Darius returned to his chambers, look at the anguish in this pagan ruler who was over one of God's servants. (laughs) First he told Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. And the words remind us of the three. And then he went into his palace and spent the night fasting. Fasting. And no entertainment was brought to him, no distraction, no dancing women, no alcohol, no whatever they did for distraction at that time. He shut himself up in his chambers and fasted 
and thought about Daniel, and he couldn't get to sleep. Sleep fled from him. Amazing. Now the providential deliverance of Daniel. Verse 19. Then the king arose at dawn at the very break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. And when he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve. He said that all the time, right? This is Daniel's testimony. This is who Daniel is. Whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Did he do it? Did he do it? I've been thinking about it all night. And then Daniel spoke to the king. O king, live forever. He didn't say praise Jehovah, right? He said, O king, live forever. Do you wonder why Daniel made it through three regimes of pagan kings? He gave them respect, people, in their place. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me. And as much as I was found innocent before him, before God, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. And then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den, and no injury whatsoever was found on him because, what? He had trusted him his God. Is that so hard, people? Is that so hard? He had trusted his God. And the king then gave orders, and they brought those men who had, ca- uh, who had maliciously accused Daniel, and they cast them, their children, and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. I would say, snap, 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 snap. snap. Right? Before they even hit the floor, they were gone. And it was the men who accused their wives and their children. Darius is a pagan king. Okay? Even though Daniel's testimony had some bearing on him, he's still a pagan king. And then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples of the nations, men of every language who were living in all the land, May your peace abound, he said. Wow, this is good stuff. The king was troubled. God put such a concern on him. And he calls out in a troubled voice. I mean, he didn't sleep all night. And the very first response that Daniel had was, O king, you're the ruler, O king. God shut the lion's mouth, but Daniel was in the den. He had to go through it, people. Abraham had to lay his son on the altar, people. The three had to go into the fiery furnace, people. These tests are for our good and God's glory. When we know what God wants us to do, it is always rewarded, but sometimes not in a way that we may wish. Daniel knew that it was right for him to pray three times a day with his windows open as he was used to doing, knowing an edict had gone out that would condemn him to the lion's den. And he did what he knew was to be right, and he got thrown in the lion's den. It's kind of like, no, no. Americans think reward means he gets free from that. He doesn't go to the lion's den, right? That's God's blessing. God's blessing is different in American minds than what it is in the Bible. We think God's blessing is on us if we have money, if we have homes, if we have nice cars, toys to play with. Right? That's God's blessing. Well, guess what? God's blessing for Daniel, who had lived 80 years of faithful life, so much so that a pagan king says, that you constantly serve your God, he saw it, and God let him go into a lion's den. There's something to be learned here, friends. Daniel sets the record straight in 623. It was because he had trusted his God that he was delivered. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. 624 shows us that (laughs) that king was pagan. That was brutal. Why the wives and children? 
I think that was vengeance. And God wreaked it upon those that came against his child, Daniel. And he worked through the king, the pagan king, and exacted that punishment. Courageous faith in perilous times began with Daniel's refusal to defile himself with unclean food when he was but a youth. And he had faced many tests throughout his long life so that when he came to this most critical test, he rose up to meet it with courageous faith. We are in training. Right now, daily people, talking to the young people in the room, talking to the old people in the room, we are in training right now. If it happens in our lifetime, which I really think it will, and persecution comes upon us, we need to be preparing for it now. Now. How do you do that? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll get to it. <laughs> so I just want to sum it up with a proclamation and some peace. A proclamation and some peace. Look at the last verses here. Verses uh, 25 through 28. The king then gave order, or excuse me, then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples and nations and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree. Here he is again. <laughs> it's the same thing Nebuchadnezzar did. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. Now that word for God is Elah. It just means the heavenly God, the high God. Daniel's God, if you will. It's not Yahweh. It's not the personal name of God because he had no personal relationship with him. But he recognizes his power. For he is the living God, Elah, and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. How did he know this? Where did he get that word? He's a, he's a Medo-Persian king. He doesn't know this. Darius the Mede. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Now he knew about that. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And so this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian so all the way to the end of the Babylonian captivity, Daniel enjoyed his peace. So his first decree in this chapter declared that he was God, at least for 30 days. That's found in 6-7. But the second decree declared that the God of the Hebrews was a true and living God. In doing this, Darius joined Nebuchadnezzar by giving public testimony to the power and glory of the high God, Elah. God could have kept Daniel out of the lion's den, but by rescuing him from the lion's den, God received even greater glory. These are hard lessons for us here in America and in the West. Listen to me. You may not be tested in a den of lions, but you will be called upon to declare your allegiance to the God of the Bible daily. You are right now, people. The simple act of praying over your lunch in a lunchroom with other people that don't pray over their lunch, is a testimony that you worship God. When you go out to eat in a restaurant, to bow your head and pray before you eat is a testimony to God. In an ungodly nation, crooked and perverse. Kids, when you're at school and in a lunchroom, bowing your head before you eat, even though all the friends around you are not believers, you're given a testimony they may ridicule you because of it, but you're not getting thrown in a lion's den. How much do you love God? The opportunities that you have every day to speak up for God, to tell others about his blessings on you and on your family, all of this is training for when perilous times come into our lives. Then you'll be able to stand. Even, you know, I, I just have to, I, I'm on Facebook, but just kind of like almost not on Facebook. But I am. And every once in a while I see something and, and I'll, I'll put a quote up or something or a meme that I think is, is good. And it's amazing to me. I get like three responses. Now, I have an entire family 
<laughs> that are on Facebook all the time. And if I put something stupid up, oh, I get so many likes. It's just amazing. But if I put anything up with any content, any content at all, it's like crickets, right? Guess what? I'm testifying for Christ. They know who I am. They know who I am. They read them. They don't hit the like button. You know why? Because they don't like it. They don't like it. And that's the way it is. We need to remember Daniel's lion den the next time that we find ourselves in a difficult and fiery trial, people. And try to remember that the Lord may have allowed you to be in that predicament that he might even gain more glory by your going through the trouble that he's allowed you to come in. There is no temptation that has taken you, but such as is common to men. I mean, we think we're the epitome of suffering when we go on a trial, right? Hey, all your brothers and sisters are going through the same thing. Let a couple of them know about it so they can pray for you, and you might be shocked to find out they went through the same thing. Don't try so hard to avoid life's difficulties, but walk closely with God through them. And as you come through the fiery trial with your faith intact and your joyful praise for your faithful God, you will be a shining witness in a crooked and a perverse generation like stars that shine in the darkness of night. That's what we're called to. Don't wait until you face that crucible. You may buckle and then have to recant your recantation. Don't be like that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for Daniel. What a hero. What a man. And someday, we will be able to talk with Daniel. We'll be able to find out what it was like to live through those 70 years in Babylon. Oh, Lord, heaven's going to be filled with times of reminiscing how we live for God on this earth. May it be so in each of our lives, Lord. Strengthen and embolden us, we pray. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.